Можем да продължаваме следващата презентация. И днес а, ще ви представя Николай Стоицев, който работи като инжиниринг менеджер в Helltech стартъпа HeloDX. И той всъщност ръководи екип, който се занимава с а, създаването на софтуерни решения за медицинска диагностика. А, Ники също така е работил в компании като Uber, VMware и много други стартъп компании. И за наше удоволствие, че той всъщност е пета поредна година а, лектор на OpenFest. Така че тази година Ники ще ни разкаже за това какво е Observability, какви инструменти можем да използваме, какви са добрите и лошите практики и всякакви детайли около Observability. Така че моля аплодисменти за Николай Стоицев. Okay. Hello everyone. This talk is going to be in English. Um, hi, my name is Nikki. I'm an engineering manager at HeloDX. And today I'm going to talk about observability. And first I'm going to start with a question. How many of you remember what this was? We, we used to use them, right? To get on airplanes. And I'm going to use it as an analogy to demonstrate what, why it's so important to have observability and uh, yeah, basically what is the purpose of it. So imagine that you're getting on an airplane and you don't know how fast it's going, you don't know where it's going, you don't know if there is some problem with it, and basically it's just flying and you have no idea uh, what's happening. Would you like to be on that airplane? No, right? Uh, you, want, you want to have something like this, basically. You want to have all the instruments, you want to know that everything is working fine with the airplane, you, you want to know that you're heading in the right direction, you want to know that you're flying at the correct altitude with the correct speed. And uh, basically you want to have all these instrument that instruments that give you visibility about the state of the thing that you're running and to know when there is a problem and to be able to troubleshoot the problem when you have a problem. And this is what observability gives you. Basically it's this instrumentation that gives you overview of the state of your system whether it's running uh, as expected or there is an issue. And when there is an issue, it helps you debug the issue and fix it efficiently and fast. And basically there are three pillars of observability that uh, we're gonna go over. So first is monitoring. Monitoring allows you to put instrumentation in your code so you can measure things. You can count things, you can measure the time that it takes to execute something, you can keep a count on uh, certain values, and basically it's a tool that helps you detect issues. Then there's logging, where uh, every application, we decorate our applications with log, with log statements. These log statements produce log messages, and the logging systems collect all the logs from all the applications that are running, no matter where, where they are and stores them in a central place. And this, this allows us to debug issues when they happen. And there's also distributed tracing, which is the third pillar that gives you a general overview of the, your system, how the traffic is going, uh, how fast it is, each request is going, and basically gives you like a map of your system and how the traffic is flowing through it. And first I'm gonna start by monitoring. So the result of monitoring looks something like this. This is a Grafana dashboard uh, that shows the stats for a, a Postgres SQL database. And you can see that on one screen you can see how much memory is consuming, uh, how, mu how much free disk there is, uh, how much CPU it's consuming. And when there is a problem, you'll be able to see it. So as a result of monitoring, we get a dashboard that looks like this. And what are the components of a mod monitoring system? First, we have a central, central system that's called monitoring system. Uh, and open source solutions here that you can use are Prometheus, which is very popular, very widely adopted. Graphite, which is uh, yeah, another very popular, widely adopted open source project, and M3DB. And the job of the monitoring system is to get the metrics that we record in our application and store them in a database. It also provides an API where the dashboarding solution that we pick connects to and 
reads the data so it can draw the fancy graphs that we saw on the previous screen. And for the dashboards, it's usually Prometheus UI, if you go with Prometheus, or you can go with Grafana, which is a very popular solution. And the previous screen, again, was Grafana. And in order to have metrics, you need to in instrument your code with metric statements. And over here, there is one example. Um, when we're counting how many times our users executed a search request. Imagine there is a search box. For example, in our medical software, there is a search box when you can search something, and it shows you all the things that match the search. Uh, it can be profile of patients that are in our system, or it can be uh, some exams that, that need, needs to be done, or yeah, other things. And basically, over here, you're counting how many times there is a successful search that happened in your system. And then you can draw a graph that, that looks like this. You can see over time how many search requests are executed. But this is not very informative, and we usually, this is not the way that we consume it. Usually we consume it in this way. Basically, we are interested in how much uh, the counter is increasing, how many operations are happening for the time interval that we have selected. And over here, you, you can see that the number of requests gradually goes up, and then it, it goes back down again to zero. Um, and yeah, over here, if it goes to zero, then we know hmm, it, it went to zero. Is there some problem with the search? Did we introduce some bug? Maybe the, there is some other bug that's preventing the users from accessing this feature at all. And when you see this, oh, it went to zero, maybe there is some problem, you know to do something about it. And it's not only counters that you can use, you, you can also measure execution time uh, with timers. Uh, and the simple way to add timers over here, this is a Java example. There is a time annotation used that allows you to record the time that it took for this method to be executed. And on the graph below, it shows the time that it takes, the average time that it takes to execute it. And by using timers, you can detect when something becomes slower than you expect um, and do something about it. There are other things that you can do with metrics, but for the simplicity, this is introduction to observability. These are the two most widely used. Um, and another useful thing that you are going to use when you work with metrics is labels. Every time when you record a metric, you can put a label. And over here, we are decorating our counter for number of searches that are executed by the type of the search. So over here, we're searching for patients. And then um, on the graph below, you can see that we can see how many times somebody searched for a patient and then how many times somebody searched for exam. And there are some tags that are automatically added to the metrics by the metric system, like on which environments it's running, is it on the staging environment, on the production environment, on which host is recorded the metric, in which data center, in which availability region, um, et cetera, is decorated with a lot of information, with the version of the software. And there are many, many labels. Okay, so these are the basic things that you need to, to know to start working with metrics, basically counters, timers, and labels. And you can build pretty much everything that you have. But pretty soon, you're gonna start hitting some problems. So basically, the next question that I want to answer for you and share my knowledge with is what to watch out for? What are some problems, some pitfalls that you may hit when working with metrics? And the first one is related to cardinality. In mathematics, cardinality means the number of elements in the set, but in the time series database, mean, it means how many things are, how many series of data are stored in the time series database. And over here, you can see that we cannot multiple labels to each metric. And over here, we have added type and application version. And each permutation of these labels create a separate database. Like you can think, think of it as a separate database schema. If we have two versions of the applications and two values for patient and exam for the type, this means that we have four database schemas equivalent if this was a relational database in our time series database for storing information. And time series da databases are optimized for executing operations on time series data very fast, but they're not optimized for storing many time series. And 
the first thing that you're gonna hit when you start working in it, with it is don't add high cardinality tags. Uh, for example, don't add user ID or session ID or something like this because it's gonna create a lot of schemas, database schemas equivalent, time series database in your store and it's gonna crumble, it's gonna crash. So this is the first first thing to watch out for. The next thing to, to know is that the metrics are not accurate. Um, and this is because the time series engines are optimized for fast operations, which means that when you execute certain operation like summing or averaging or percentile cal calculation or histogram calculation or averaging for five minutes or dividing one series by another, you ex execute different operations on the time series data. And sometimes the d database engine is gonna skip some values, sometimes it's gonna come up with some values via interpolation. And uh, yeah, basically it's optimized for fast operations. It's not optimized for correct results. And uh, when performing some operation on different time resolution, again, the, the time series database is doing some operation. If you have store, store your data, for example, in five seconds intervals, and when you query it, for example, I want the uh, sum for each minute by minute, then it's gonna do some uh, averaging, some interpolation, and again, the operation is not going to be very correct. And also, time series database are archiving metrics for long-term storage. And the reason for this is that the time series traffic uh, usually grows very fast. For every operation in your system, like there is for every one search, we are emitting a lot, a lot of counters. How many times it's successful? How many times it's failed? Uh, what results did it return? Was it the empty result? Uh, how, how much time it took to execute the application logic, the database query? And you can see that for one operation, we are recording many, many, many metrics. This is why the metrics volume, the traffic of the, the volume of the tra metrics traffic is very big, and it's gonna fill up the database very fast. So the time series databases are archiving some metrics for long-term storage, losing accuracy. So long story short, don't rely on metrics for business intelligence. For making decisions about your companies, you cannot calculate your revenue, you cannot uh, calculate your inventory with metrics in infrastructure. It's not built for it. It's built to detect an outage in 10 seconds from it happening, uh, even if it's there, there's a lot, a lot of traffic involved in it. And the next thing, next thing to know is uh, don't you use average values. Um, because when you, for example, you want to see how much time it takes you to execute the search query, to know how much time a user needs to wait to see the search results after they type their thing that they want to search for. If you use average values, you lose the outliers. So you don't know what are the worst cases, the maximum amount of time that the user is sitting in front of the screen and waiting for the search, search results. And it also don't gives you the typical behavior because of the outliers. So you don't get the outliers, you don't get the typical behavior. Basically, it's worst of both worlds. You, you don't you lose visibility of your system. Um, and something other that you can use is percentiles. And you can hear, for example, pe people talking about P90 or P95, which means a 19 percentile, which means if you get all the values that you have recorded, you delete the highest 10% of them, and the highest value that's left is your 19 percentile, or 95, if you do it for your 95%. Basically, it's what is the worst experience that people see 90% of the time? And over here, you can see that it's to totally different. The average time that it takes for this search query is about 300 milliseconds, but the P90, which means that 90% of the user need to wait almost a second for the results to, to be returned, which is bad, right? One second, you're staring at the screen and you're wondering, is it frozen, what happened? Um, yeah, so use percentiles. And also sometimes series databases support histograms, which is another uh, thing that you can use. And it is better because it show you the whole distribution. Over here, you can see that most of the, most of the queries uh, complete for 100 to 300 milliseconds time, but then there are some outliers and you can see basically the whole distribution, which is very useful. So third lesson, don't use averages, use percentiles or histograms when 
when, the, when using with metrics. And uh, basically, this is pretty much everything you need to know to go and put some metrics in your code. You can go right now, put some metrics, and then you build the Grafana dashboards and everything is cool, right? Now you need now you need to put the metrics on big screens in the office, and then you need to put people to sit on chairs and look at the screens all day, right? To see if something's breaking, uh, which is usually not the case. You don't want people staring at screens and watching at all the values to know that something crashes. You want to set up automatic alerts. And here is one example of such an alert. Uh, this is the success rate of the our previous example, the search functionality, and we are measuring how many, how, what percent of percentage of the time it's returning successful results. Well, basically, is it working? When it's 100, it's working 100 percent of the time. And over here, we have configured an uh, automatic alert where we say if the success rate drops below 70 percent, then notify the engineers that are working on it. And you can put different uh, thresholds. You can put a warning threshold where when it falls, falls below 90%, then it sends a Slack or Teams message to say, hey, maybe there's something bro broken. It's not yet a problem, but you should check it. it maybe it's going to break soon. And then you can put another threshold that say, when it drops below 70%, then send the message to the on-call. Uh, and yeah, th these are alert levels. And the alerting tool, the place where you configure automatic alerts is usually built inside your metric system. So if you, you're working with Prometheus, there is Prometheus alerting agent, Prometheus alerts manager, Prometheus alerts manager, uh, where you configure the alerts. If you're working with Graphite, there's also alerts in it. Basically the alerting is built in your monitoring solution, in your metric system. and you can also do it in some dashboards. For example, in Grafana, you can configure alerts in Grafana itself. And there are a couple of things that you need to think about when you think about alerts. So every time when you configure an alert and somebody gets an alert based on a metric, it should be something that's urgent, something that really needs to be fixed right now, and something that's important. If we don't fix it, our users are having a problem and they're not happy with us. And we need to fix it now. And it's very important for our users. It also should be something actionable. There is no reason to send an alert to an engineer if they cannot do anything about it, right? And it's also, it should also be something real, something happening in the, in the real world. Um, and basically, when you configure alerts and when alert, alert fires, it should be something that represents either something that's happening right now or something that's going to happen real soon that's very bad. Um, and again, with monitoring, there are some things to watch out for when you configure alerts. There are some common misconceptions and common mistakes that people make. So the first thing is to always keep in mind that sometimes we configure an alert, but we're not, we're not doing the job very well. Basically, it's not configured very well, and it starts firing very often. So the alert is firing very often. We check it every time. Every time we say, well, it's not a problem, but let's keep it like this. And it's keep firing, firing, firing. It creates a, starts creating noise. And when an alert starts creating noise, it's very easy to ignore it. And then most of the time, there's not going to be a problem when you're going to ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. We know, oh, this is the noisy alert. Maybe the, maybe it's, everything's fine, and then one time the thing is not going to work. But you you gonna say to yourself, well, this is a noisy alert. I know I know about it. It's happening very often. I'm just gonna ignore it, and you're gonna miss a real pro issue that happened in your system. So when there is an alert and the alert is noisy, it's better to remove it. The next thing to uh, think about this. Uh, this is the again the graph with successful searches, and you can see it goes. There is some seasonality. Um, there, there's not much traffic. Then there is some spike. Then there's seasonal traffic. Then there's uh, some spike. And the question here is what, where to put the threshold. Uh, sometimes it goes to zero, but it looks like that it's like business as usual. Some sometimes of the day. 
people are just not searching for patients or exam. And it doesn't mean that our software is not working. It means that just this feature is not used. So if it's zero, it's fine. Uh, and when we, we look at it, and we're not very sure what to put the threshold, right? And the same thing with the errors. For example, we can say if there are more than five errors, then uh, raise an alert to the on-call engineers. But again, sometimes it's going to go above five, but this is just because you have spike in your traffic. For example, people are executing 10,000 searches per second, and five of them are failing, which is 0 0.005 per 0 0.05 percent. And yeah, you're raising an alert for something that is working fine um, in, inside your SLA. So every time when you can, it's better to use success rate. Basically, you record when your users attempt to do something, and then you record whether it was successful, and then you divide the successful over the attempts, and you get success rate. This is very informative because no matter if people st stop using your software or there, there is a spike in the traffic, it's always working. Uh, it's always show you the percentage of the time when, when, in, when it's working. So always use, use success rate and not hard thresh thresholds for your alerts. This is second thing to keep, to keep in mind. And then the third thing has, has to do with the types of alerts, types of metrics that you record. So the first type of metrics and alerts that you can put is called symptom-based alerts. And these are the symptoms of some problems that are happening in your system. And the first example is number of 500 errors. A 500 error can happen because of many different reasons. Maybe your database is down. Maybe you have a bug in your application code. Maybe you have a bug in your uh, networking. Maybe you, you have a um, bug in your infrastructure. Basically, it can happen for very, very different reasons. Um, another symptom is response time. You can have increased response time because your database is slow, your network is slow, you have written slow code, uh, your clients are slow. Basically, there are very, very things that can happen in response time. Same with external things. For example, email, email sending is, is not working. We're using some third party. We're not sure, is it the third party not working that should send the email, or is it our code not working? Again, no idea. And same for user cannot log in. This is a symptom of very, very different types of problems, right? Database can be down. User may, may not have permissions. Our permission logic may be broken. Our validation rules may be broken. We, we've no idea. Many things can broke it. And this is called symptom-based monitoring. And then there is another type of monitoring that's called, that's called cost-based monitoring. And this is when we measure and we set to learn so or specific things like free disk space on a database server. If we get an alert that's saying you're running out of free disk space on database server two, you know very well what is the root cause of the problem. There is the disk space there is running low. low. Or if you have an alert that's saying uh, you have very high memory utilization for the service that's called for your authorization service authentication service. And then you say, okay, there's problem with the authentication service. There is some memory leak in it. And same with free file, file descriptors. You know that there is some application somewhere that's taking a lot of file descriptors and it's keeping them and you're pretty sure what, where, what's the root cause. Where is the problem? And yeah, many causes can cause a symptom. As I said, when something's not working, it can Maybe it's not working because of very different reasons. Infrastructure, third-party systems, bucking in your code, bucking your clients, very di many different causes. But the thing to keep in mind of is that the user impact is most important. When your users cannot log in in your system, they don't care if your Postgres SQL is down, whether your RabbitMQ um, is not delivering the messages in the right way, whether you have put some, misconfigured some firewall rules and you're not allowing traffic in your system, user don't care about it. The user is, is affected, they cannot log in, and they won't want to get it fixed. And yeah, and users typically care about accessing their functionality. They want to be able to do the thing that your software does. They want the things to happen uh, very fast or not slower than they usually are happening. 
they also want to know that the data they're seeing is fresh. And uh, yeah, basically the user impact, no matter what it is, is the most, Im most important thing to keep in mind. So the third thing that is very common misconception is focus on systems-based alerts. Because if you try to focus on cost-based alerts, you, you very, it will be very hard for you to enumerate all the reasons why your users will not be able to log in, for example, or do a search. The, the thing that you're monitoring and the third thing that you're alerting on should be the fact that they cannot execute a search and they, the fact that they cannot execute, they can't log in. Uh, because this is what, what they care about. And this covers all the failures that can happen in your system. And it will be harder for you to miss a case where, oh, I forgot to configure an, an alert on free file descriptors, for example, or high memory utilization. Next time I need to add it. Uh, you, you don't need to enumerate all the cases when your system is failing, but you know, want to know when functionality that the users are using is not working. So focus on symptoms-based alerts. But sometimes, yeah, keep in mind that cost-based alerts are necessary. And for the example with the database where it's running out of disk space is a very good example. You want to have an alert that you're running out of disk space before it happens. And yeah, so for things like this, you need cost-based alerts uh, for yeah, things that are we know that can br can break. And when you configure your monitoring, you're gonna start wondering yourself from where to start. And the a correct strategy here is always pick alerts that are closer to your clients. So either your most outer facing load balancer or your client applications, your front ends, your mobile applications, this is where you want to focus on. Um, and over here there is, for example, in, on the load balancer, you can count the success rate of a certain operation, like search, for example. And when you configure su such an alert, it's gonna handle all the failures that can trigger it. For example, database is down, database is overloaded, not enough database connections, network is overloaded, network is very slow, wrong firewall, rules configured on your network, booking your backend code, Commun communication between the load balancer and the backend code is not working, your load balancer is misconfigured. A myriad of reasons can happen that, is, that are breaking your application. So start with the things that the user are seeing. They're seeing your API responses and they're seeing the functionality in the application that they can access. Can they log in? Can they execute search? These are the things that business events, functionality that your users are working that you want to start with and configure alerts for these parts of your application. And now, great. We have alerts, we have monitoring, we have dashboards, we have alerts. And then one day we get an alert and we start scratching our head and thinking, okay, we have uh, some problem in our system. There is an alert. I need to fix it. I need to fight find the root cause. And usually this is happening with logging. We're using our logging infrastructure that we have to basically find the error that's happening or see where our code is breaking so we can fix the root cause of the issue. Push a code or revert a commit or restart something or yeah, whatever needs to be done to, be, to fix the problem. And usually the result is from the logging is something that, that looks like this. You have, uh, this is a Kibana dashboard. It aggregates all the logs from all the applications where your software is, is running, all the containers or the places where your application is running, and it show, stores them in a central place that gives you a query interface where you can query your logs. And you can say, give me all errors from this service. Or give me all, uh, exceptions that contain this string or uh, group all exceptions so I know how many they are or group by field. Give me all logs from search operations that are for patients, for example. The logging solution provides you an interface that aggregates your logs on the cent in a central place and gives you an interface to query them in a very flexible way. And the logging system usually collect, uh, is built from local 
collectors that are sitting alongside the applications that you're collecting log messages from. Uh, for example, the application is writing the logs to a file on the, fi on the file system, and then the log collector are reading the file. It can also, they can also read from a socket or from any process-to-process -process communication mechanism that exists in the uh, environment where the application is running. And the log collector gets the log from the application and sends them to a log aggregator. And the job of the log aggregator is to ag aggregate the logs from all the log collectors and store them in a database, a database that allows searching. And two popular open source solutions for this is Logstash and FluentD. And these are the systems that are collecting logs and can store them in different uh, mediums like databases or object storages or uh, relational databases, whatever, whatever we want. So the database is usually Elasticsearch or open source project called Loki, and the dashboarding solution is usually Kibana. These are the most popular open source projects for, for building a logging system. And here is how logs looks like in your system. Basically, you can record strings that gives you information that something happened in your system. For example, patient was created. Uh, no patient with this contact information has been found. So the, there, this is why there are no search results. And you can also record errors like fa fail to generate PDF or when something happens in your system that breaks it. And you can see that there is method that's called info, method that's called warn, method that's called error. This is different log level. Then when you go in your dashboard solution, you can say, give me all log messages with severity warning or with severity error. And you can filter based on the severity, severity of the logs that you have recorded. And yeah, you, you can find logs by different criteria. You can search by content of the message. For example, if you think that there's some problem with your notification sending me mechanism, you want to see if there are any exceptions recorded with the word notification in them. Then you just query message to dots notification, and then it's going to show you all the log messages that contain this word. Or you can see, say, give me all the log messages from the Kubernetes application that's called app-gateway, which is application gateway. And you can combine them. You can search by, by severity. You can say when something includes this, but it doesn't include that, or something is in the, this list. Basically, it gives you a very flexible way to query your logs and find the log messages that you're interested in so you can debug the issue. And again, with the previous, with alerting and with monitoring, there are some things to watch out for, some things that you need to know in order to set up your logging in an efficient way. And the first thing is to use appropriate log level. Every time when you record a log message, you need to think, is it something that's just informational, something that's warning but not actually a problem, or is it something that's problem that should be of error level? This will allow you later on to filter your logs by their meaning, by their semantics, and you find the appropriate logs more easily. And another thing that you need to know about is called structured logging. Basically, you can add key value pairs to your logs, and then later on, you can search by those keys. For example, if there is a log message that, say, that says fail to generate PDF, you want to know which PDF of your thousands PDF in your system exactly cannot be generated. And you can filter by template name, which is like, um, yeah. And you know that for this template, so there's something wrong with this template, and this is why it's not working. Or you can also say search returned no results. Then you say, what is the search type? Is it search for patients, for example, from the previous example, or is it search for exams? And again, you can see that, oh, there are only search, res search returned no results for patients. This means that there is some bug with my code that is searching for patients. So second thing to think, uh, always think about is always use structured logging. This is a very good practice, and otherwise it's going to be very hard for you to extract useful information from the log. And another thing to keep in mind is that there are 
always there are too many logs. So for every operation that you're executing, if you want your code to be easy to debug, easy to maintain, easy to find issues and troubleshoot root causes, you need to get, have a lot of log statements. For example, for if we get an, get an example with the search, you want to have a log statement that's saying search started, these are the, per, the input parameters, um, this, this is the, we started sending the database query, the database query could start, stop uh, basically returned results or it didn't return results or it returned this exception or um, yeah and then it, and then you're gonna say the user is allowed to see these results this is the result from the authentication logic from the authorization logic then then some other filtering then some business processing basically you're gonna have 20 20 log statement just for this one operation that is search and basically there's always more logging traffic than there is application traffic if you want to have a system that's easy to debug. So there's always too many logs that, that you can store. This is why every real-time search engine supports a retention period. And you can configure your database engine, for example, to store the logs just for the last month or for the last week or for the last three days. And when the logs are older than that, they older than the set retention period, they are deleted discarded. And this is one way to solve the problem. But then from time to time you need to fix bugs that are that happened a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago. So you actually don't want to lose the logs. And one way to solve this problem is to move all the logs to cold storage, which is usually something cheap to store data in like HDFS or S3 or data, any database that you can think of. And uh, over there, it's cheap to store logs, but it's not flexible to query them. The queries are slower. Maybe you need to write some custom script to find what you need, but they're there. You, you didn't lose the logs. And one, another way to solve the problem with too many logs is to put your logs in cold storage. So yeah, use proper retention period for the amount of times that you need need to have your logs easily accessible with faster queries, and then move everything else to cold storage. And so now we have alerting, we have monitoring, we have logging to debug the issues, but sometimes we need to have this general overview of how the information is flowing in the system. And this is what distributed tracing allows you to do. Distributed tracing draws you a map that shows the path that each request that came in your system went through. So first it goes, went to this service, then it went to this service, then it queried these two databases, then it pushed a message to this message queue, then this message was consumed by this consumer, then it wrote the results in this database. It basically draws this interaction diagram between the services for every request that gives you like a general overview of what the, the system is doing and what information is flowing through which services in what sequence. And I'm not gonna dig deep into it because I did a separate talk for it in OpenFest a couple of years ago, you can watch it. But basically this is what you get. Uh, the results, the, the request that went, and you can see how much time was spent in each system, in each database that was touched. And basically, yeah, it's very nice talk. Go and watch it if you want to learn more about distributed tracing. So to summarize, in order to have observability, good observability over your system, configure automated alerts, use metrics and tracing to pinpoint the problem after you get an alert to pinpoint where it might, the problem may originate, then use logs. Use structured logging to find the root cause to see the exception or to find where your code, code stopped working and fix the problem and make sure metrics are back to normal. Every time when you get an alert and it goes to error state, after the fix, you should see the alert or the metric goes back to the nominal state that we expect and this is the definition. The problem is fixed when the metric matrix is back to normal. And that was pretty much it. Um, thank you very much for your for your time, and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you very much for the presentation. It was definitely very interesting, and I think it's an essential thing for most of all modern modern solutions, really. Uh, now we have time for some questions. So do we have any? Yep, we have a question. Hi, very good talk. Thank you about it. Uh, I have a question about the cardinality and how do you fight with it. So my question is, you said that uh, we don't, uh, we shouldn't store user IDs, but I have a very, very real world example, which is basically you have multi-million websites, you're hosting them, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to, uh, for example, count the number of uh, five XX errors uh, per each website. And uh, if you attach uh, the, the website to, uh, to this metric, uh, this creates uh, multi-million uh, values yeah. of the uh, metric called 5xx. So how do you fight with this problem? Yeah. So if you put this in Prometheus, as it is, it's going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th there is basically a label which is called, for example, 5xx. And uh, yeah. to, uh, uh, actually, the label is site. And yeah. you say that the uh, site is uh, X, Z, and etc. Et, et and uh, the metric is for 5xx errors. Uh, you, you basically want to identify which of the websites you are hosting you would like to, uh, uh, is producing actually the, the error in question. Yeah. So there is no, no easy way to fix the problem. So there are some commercial software, uh, like, for example, InfluxDB. They have an article and they claim that they can handle high cardinality data very efficiently. I don't know. But the way that I'm, gonna, I, I'm going to approach the problem if I have to solve it is the only solution that I can think of is basically uh, sharding. So you have, for example, a million, um, million things that you can put. Uh, I'm going to measure, for example, if it's going to crash on every, for example, 10,000 I, I can store yeah, 10,000 things. You're splitting uh, yeah, metrics split. on different storage types, yeah. so you later collect from all, from all of them. Uh, one more question about the cardinality, because I'm not sure. Is it coming from the values of the labels? Mm -hmm. Is the cardinality generated from the values, or yeah. rather from the labels? So you're basically having many different labels that creates the different view of the database, or it is the values inside? So uh, it, where, where it comes from? Is it from the yeah. keys or from the values? It's per permutation of both. So if you introduce high cardinality of the keys or the values, it doesn't matter because it's permutation of both. So you get the permutation of all the values for all the keys. So no matter what you, where you put the high cardinality thing, if you have high cardinality keys or high cardinality values, it's going to create the same number of uh, distinct time series. And uh, yeah, that sounds good. So like if, if I have only one label, which is called site, Cardinality comes from the fact that uh, those are the values that are multiple. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Do we have any more questions? All right. Well, if you want to speak with Nikki, you can do it at the speaker's corner after the session. And once again, please applause for Nikki.